It's a thrill. I think it's a victory for us to have him come. Um, and I've supervised two PhDs on his work, but I've never had a chance to meet him myself. So I'm really excited and I hope that you will be too. So mark it on your calendars now for next year to be here and, uh, and hear from Oliver O'Donovan and to engage with him and his work. So I invite you uh, a year in advance so you'll be able to put it down and not forget. Thanks very much. And for more housekeeping. <laughs> I was going to say something about when they go low, we go high, but I won't. <laughs> it is my privilege <laughs> to introduce to you on this third night of the 2016 Hayward Lectures our speaker, Dr. John Walton. After 20 years of teaching at Moody Bible Institute since 2001, Dr. Walton has taught at Wheaton College in Illinois. His PhD is from Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. And his research, as we have heard, focuses on the Old Testament, specifically comparing the, cultural and liter the culture and literature of the Bible and that of the ancient Near East. As Dr. Walton has reiterated many times, in the last few days. The goal of his research is to provide an interpretation of Genesis that takes seriously the fact that God, in his wisdom, chose to work through the people of ancient Israel, a people who swim in a cultural river quite different from our own. But as Dr. Walton has also stressed, and as his message in chapel this morning made abundantly clear, Different cultural rivers do not mean that the message of Genesis is irrelevant to us today. And I would now invite you, John, to come and to teach us about the significance of Genesis 2 and 3 and to share your insights on how we can be faithful interpreters of these non-controversial chapters of the Bible. Thanks, Matthew. So Matthew, it would seem like you're a housekeeper and I'm passe, but you know, it's, no, that's exciting that, uh, that Oliver Donovan is coming next year. What a great opportunity you have. Anyway, so we press on. Uh, we press on to, yes, probably the most controversial of the topics that we are um, taking on uh, this, in this lecture series. And so we have to be, again, ready to think along the lines that have been laid out in the previous two lectures. Uh, I hope lots of you either were able to be here to hear them or listening online or have caught up with them because what we're doing today is, is fundamentally based on what we have done in the previous two evenings. And so let's get to it. Um, the question of human origins is the one that most, most stridently taxes the communications that we have in faith and science. And the questions that surround evolution, uh, which becomes more and more prominent, uh, even as it's continually evolving itself. Uh, before my father had died this past summer, he and I used to talk about the books that I was publishing and talk about, you know, kind of the implications. And he would say, you've, you've got to understand. He says, I, I hear what you're saying and it makes sense to me. It seems like it's pointing us in a, in a good direction. He said, but you have to understand, for my generation, the word evolution is simply a toxic term. And it's just hard to wrap your brain around anything that might suggest that that's okay. Um, and so this whole idea um, of, of trying to think in new ways. Now, I'm not here to push any kind of science. Uh, you've gotten that, that idea certainly in what we've done already. My training is not in science. My message is not a science message. I want to know what claims the biblical text is making. And so we laid the hermeneutics the first night. We talked about Genesis 1 last night talking about how the Bible makes claims, authoritative claims. 
and what claims are being made and what claims are not being made. And that's really the level of my interest in the human origins question as well. Um, I get accused an awful lot out there on the blogosphere of being a closet evolutionist. You know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't push a science. I, I'm not qualified to push a science. Um, I'm a text analyst. I'm not even a theologian. I'm a text analyst, and we're going to look carefully at text as we have done uh, to try to understand what claims it makes. Based on that, then you can sit back and say, okay, so how do I how do I work through the, the issues of the things that science claims? And really, what are science's claims? You know, it's, that's a whole other whole nother series. So, uh, we're going to work in the biblical text. And so, of course, we're going to start in Genesis 2 and 3. Uh, we're going to be mostly in chapter 2 tonight. And so, we better start out by talking about Adam. Adam, of course, is a Hebrew word. You didn't know how much Hebrew you knew. Um, so Adam, uh, and um, as we've talked about already, we come to understand the meanings of Hebrew words by looking at them in context. So having Adam attached to a human being, uh, Adam just means humanity. Um, yet we choose to translate it often as a personal name in Genesis 1 through 5, and it's very rarely a personal name. So there are 34 occurrences, and just in Genesis 1 through 5, we find that it occurs sometimes without the definite article. Now, without the definite article, there's a couple different things, ways that it could be interpreted. First, five times it does appear to be a personal name, but you can see they're all pretty late into Genesis 1 through 5. But there's something else I need to mention here. It's on that second line. These are not their real names. The one we call Adam, Eve did not call him Adam. And Adam did not call her Eve. And I've talked to them, so I know, no, wait, no. Um, <laughs> how do I know this? I know this because Adam and Eve are Hebrew terms. And Hebrew did not exist as a language until middle of the second millennium at the earliest. So, even back in the time of Abraham, they were not speaking Hebrew. Hebrew did not exist. And certainly as you go further and further back, that means that these names are not historical names. I believe Adam and Eve are real flesh and blood people, but this is not their names. These are names given by a Hebrew-speaking audience to these two characters. And that means that those names are given with some sort of broad meaning in mind. It's not just the one they were born with. Okay? It, we, we can't think of it in those terms. They are designated by Hebrew speakers as being named humanity and life. Now, if you were to read in your Bible translations, open it up and read about humanity and his woman, wife, or life, I'm sorry, life, you'd think about these texts a lot differently. These are what I would call archetypal names, and we'll talk about that word, archetypal names, in that they kind of refer to Mm, something about their, mm, yes, I'm going to say it, identity. And we're going to be tracking that as we talk through this. So these are not their historical names. These are given names by the Israelite audience with significance connected to them. Uh, we also find that without the definite article, it's used four times just to refer to humanity in general. So early on, Genesis 1.26, God created Adam, humanity, male and female. Okay, clearly that's a more generic, en masse kind of thing. And so several places where it's used that way. Then other times, and actually most of the time in Genesis 2 and 3, it is used with the definite article. 
Now that's just not a grammatical detail. It is a grammatical detail, but it's not just a grammatical detail because that means specifically that it's not being used as a personal name. Okay, Hebrew would not put a definite article on a personal name. We don't do that in English either. Well, except the Donald, of course, but <laughs> okay, we're not going to go there. <laughs> so they, they don't put definite articles on personal name. That means every time it occurs with a definite article, it's not using it as a personal name. Now, it's one thing to observe that. It's another thing to figure out what to make of it. Okay, so we're going to work through this here. 20 times, generally, an archetypal individual. And that's, that's the way that it tends to cut. Now, the next thing we need to talk about, I'm just going to put that to the side for a moment. We've got that information. Now we have to cover the next question. What is the relationship between Genesis 2 and the seven-day account in Genesis 1. We'll just call it Genesis 1, even though it leaks into Genesis 2 a little bit. Okay, so what's the relationship between the two? Most people, without really thinking, assume that Genesis 2, Adam and Eve, gives you a um, recapitulation of day 6. Day 6, God created people. Okay, fine. Um, and then you get to chapter 2, and now it talks about this, and this must be more detail, recapitulating the events of day 6. Now, that's kind of been a traditional, common way to think about it, but really, is that the best way to think about it? Is that the only way to think about it? What are the other options, and what evidence might they have? So we have to ask questions. When we spot ourselves having presuppositions, it's always worthwhile saying, okay, is that a good presupposition to hold? Is that worthwhile? Now when we think about it, it's been rather problematic to see chapter 2 as a recapitulation of day 6, especially for those people who consider the days to be 24-hour days. Because then they say, wow, there's a whole lot going, that's a busy, busy day. You know, I mean, God has to plant a garden and all of that grows and he has to create man and put him in the garden and then next thing you know, he's got to do all the animals and then he, Adam's got to name the animals and then he's got to figure out he's lonely, you know, and the, you know, that's because it's time for Netflix in the evening and he's bored. No, okay, so you know, all of this that's happening you know, and then Eve, and, and, wow, busy, busy day. So it's not without problems. It also has some difficulties because in chapter 1, animals were created, then people on day 6. Here you read chapter 2, and it's Adam, and then God created the animals and brings them to Adam to see what he would name them. Now, some of your translations do a little sneaky there, and they say, the Lord God had created the animals. Don't fall for it. That's not, that. there's a way to do that in Hebrew, and that's not it. Okay, so there have been some of these difficulties of trying to, to correlate day six with chapter two. But what if it's not? What if chapter 2 is not recapitulating day 6? The question is, of course, how would we know? How could we figure something like that out? Idea. We have this literary introduction that comes between the two accounts. After day 7, chapter 2, verse 4, a literary introduction that then moves us into chapter 2. Now, we're in, we're in luck here because this is the first of 11 such literary introductions. I actually think there's 12 because you might remember I said 1-1 one, one was also a literary introduction. But that doesn't follow exactly the same form. These 11 follow the same form. Okay, so this is the account of. Toledot is the word. These are called the Toledot formulas. And there are 11 of them. That means that we can look at all 11 situations and ask the question, how does what comes after the formula relate in time to what comes before the formula? See, now we have data. We can actually take a look at it. 
Well, there they are. Okay, so now you've got the references and you've got the connections that are made. And then in that middle column, you have what relationship there is. Now you can see that a couple of them, uh, like 1110 and things like that, I call recursive. Um, and recursive means that they're kind of following one line and then they come back and pick up the other line. So with Ishmael, they follow Ishmael through a genealogy to a certain end point, and, but then they come back and they pick up Isaac. Okay, because that's the story they really want to tell. And it happens with Esau and Jacob, uh, this recursion. Okay, recursion is not telling the same story again. That's recapitulation. Recursion is just coming back to a starting point and then going with another line. So they follow Cain's line in chapter 4. Then they come back and pick up Seth's line. Okay? You get the idea. They do this often enough. And so that's recursion. And that, can, that happens in a few of them, as you can see. But it always happens with brothers. If it's not brothers, then the only other option that we see is sequel. That is, it tells one story, then it has the formula, and it moves to the next story. However much time has gone by in between, sometimes a long time, sometimes a short time, uh, but it's sequel. Now, as we look at that, we notice that none of them are recapitulative. None of them. It doesn't do that. That should lead us to question whether we should just automatically assume that chapter 2 is recapitulation of day 6. If the text never uses these formulas to do a recapitulation or to introduce a recapitulation, we ought to be suspicious at least and consider other alternatives. If it's a sequel, like all of these are when they don't deal with brothers, if it's a sequel, then, huh, the people in Genesis 1 are not necessarily Adam and Eve. Huh. Wow. Okay. After all, Genesis 1 does not mention Adam and Eve. Genesis 1 doesn't mention that there's a single pair. And that suggests the possibility, at least, that Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, is a sequel. Hmm. It has some advantages. Okay, then that means the second account doesn't need to fit into day six. That saves us some troubles. Okay, because there are some problems doing that. It also answers some other things for us because if the Adam and Eve story is a sequel, that means that in Genesis 1, this is, this is a population that's been created. Humanity, not just two people. And that wouldn't be a surprise because look in chapter 1. The birds, population. Fish, population. Not these two fishies and then all the other fishies came from them. All of the animals, populations. All of chapter 1 is working in populations. And that suggests that the Bible may have this idea that there were lots of people, a whole population, at least around Adam and Eve, or that Adam and Eve came from, depending how close you put the sequel. Now, the Bible doesn't mention anything like that in chapter 2, but it is giving hints about it in chapter 4. After all, Cain finds a wife. I never really did like the sister option, just saying, you know. <laughs> Now, furthermore, when God drives Cain away, Cain says, now anybody who finds me will kill me. Mom, is that you? Dad, come on, stop it. I mean, who's he talking about? And then in chapter 4, he goes and builds a city. You can't build a city for yourself. That's not a city. It's a man cave. <laughs> and I don't know the Hebrew word for that. <laughs> so, uh, by the time we hit chapter 4, it kind of looks like there's a population that's involved here. And if you accept the idea of chapter 2 as a sequel, 
that fits with that idea. But then of course you would, of course you would have the question, well then what makes Adam and Eve so special? See, now we're asking a good question. That's what we should be asking. What makes Adam and Eve so special? If there's a population around them, what do we do with that? Well, see, now we can ask about a question that we probably haven't thought about before and see what we can come up with. So where do we go from there? How do we think about what's going on then with Adam and Eve? Now what I'm going to suggest to you is that Adam and Eve are archetypal. My proposal, just like my proposal last night, was kind of that it was all about order and function and purpose and that it was about sacred space, okay? That was my proposal last night. My proposal tonight is embedded in this idea of archetypal functions. That Adam and Eve serve as archetypes. And we have to understand what that means. And we will, okay? What I'm saying then is that everything in Genesis 2 regarding human origins is first and foremost archetypal. Now, I'm not just dumping that on you as my opinion. We've got evidence and we're going to develop it. Okay, remember the strength of any interpretation is in its evidence. We, no one should expect you to just believe it because it's their opinion. What's the evidence to support it? And so that's what we're going to present. So, what's going on with this? Uh, first of all, an archetype is not the same thing as a prototype. A prototype is just the first one off the assembly line. You know, so that, that's, that's important, but that's not the same thing. With an archetype, you get a sense of embodiment of the whole. Now, the example I use, I've got mothers there. Ran into this on the internet. Uh, what a fascinating thing. Uh, this interviewer was talking to uh, eight and nine-year-olds. And he posed the question to them, what are mothers made of? And, uh, you know, got the answers from the kids. And what's interesting is that they spotted that as an archetypal question right from the get-go. They wouldn't have used that word, but they knew exactly what was going on. They weren't just supposed to describe their individual mother. They're supposed to describe mothers. Okay, so one little girl notably said, mothers are made of angel wings and clouds. And, and string <laughs> and a little bit of mean <laughs> <laughs> now what's interesting is that she not only understood the nature of an archetype she also picked up right away that you can describe an archetype by talking about ingredients and so she did this is what mothers are made of. Now, we could argue about whether we would agree with her choices of ingredients to describe the archetypal typical mother, but the fact is, understand what she's doing and don't go biology on me here. Okay? This is not about mother's origins and it has nothing scientific about it. It's talking about a mother's identity and that's what the archetypal idea picks up so this is about human identity rather than human origins now that's going to sound a lot familiar of what we talked about last night when I suggested that chapter one was more about cosmic identity than cosmic origins and in chapter two, I would make that point even more strongly. We've already gotten a glimpse of human identity in chapter one because we are the image of God. That is our identity. It's not our biology, it's not our neuroscience, it's not our anatomy, it's our identity. And so in that sense, we have to see that the Bible's dealing with a different question than what we want to try to use it for. It's our cultural river that wants to try to drag biology out of this conversation. And that's our cultural river, our questions, our issues, our concerns, etc. 
this is not intended to be a passage to deal with human origins. It's to be a passage of human identity. And Adam and Eve are the archetypes that show us what the text has to teach us about human identity. So I would suggest that the forming accounts are most relevant to Adam and Eve as archetypes rather than as individuals. Again, I believe they are flesh and blood individuals. But that doesn't mean that they have to be tra treated in that way. After all, mothers are flesh and blood individuals. But the discussion wasn't about that. Now, you should be asking the question at this point. He's making all these broad statements. How do you know? How do you know that they're archetypal rather than individual? How do you know? Well, we know because we're going to look at the passages and see how it treats them. Our key rule of thumb, it can be identified, any element can be identified as archetypal if it refers to everyone, not just to them as individuals. Is what it's going to tell us about Adam true only of Adam, uniquely, distinctively of Adam? Or is what it's going to tell us about Adam something that is true of all of us? If we can demonstrate that it's true of all of us, then Adam becomes the archetype of that particular issue. If it's something that's true only of Adam, well then we can say, well that's distinctively him. And we're going to look to the text to give us that information. Because I don't want to just make it up myself. Okay, we're going to look at the text. Ah, yes. So, formed from dust. When we think about being formed from dust, what do we think is going on? Some people think, especially if they're really in our modern cultural river, they think that that somehow is a clue, a hint about chemistry. Okay? What the human body is made from, chemically, silicates, and, and I'm already past my science understanding now. Okay? But, but they think in terms of somehow that that's, again, if you read chemistry, if you read science into the Bible, that somehow that's hidden information that they didn't know. After all, the Israelites' periodic table was very small. No, they didn't have a periodic table. <laughs> okay? And that, that's how some people do it. Now, I don't think that's too many people, but I've seen that done. Some people try to do that. More commonly, people think of it in terms of um, uh, the significance is craftsmanship. Here's God down on his knees in the dirt, getting his hands grubby, you know, forming uh, as on a potter's wheel, the human being. Okay, now at that point you have to ask, okay, does God have knees and, and hands and is that really what he's doing? But beyond that, that craftsmanship image doesn't work here because it doesn't say that he was formed from clay. It says dust. Clay is moldable. Dust is not. You can't, you can't mold anything with dust. You say, well, God can do anything. But see, if it's trying to make a point of craftsmanship, it would use clay. Now, if it's not chemistry, and it's not craftsmanship, then what in the world's going on? What's taking place here? Well, we could look at the word formed. Is that what's next? Oh, yeah. Okay. It says he formed humanity, but there's something very interesting here in the Hebrew syntax. The preposition from is not there. He formed humanity. Dust of the ground. That makes it sound a little more archetypal just by itself. Now, I'm not going to get into the Hebrew details. There are people who try to say, yeah, but it's okay that it doesn't have the preposition and we still have this relationship between the... Fine. But just for you to know, the preposition from is not there. And so he formed humanity. Dust to the ground. It gives you more of a sense of 
this idea of identity in what we are. And we also notice that basically the verb forms, even though it sounds very material to us, is often in scripture not used materially. And here we find that he's forming the identity of a person, their nefesh, which is often translated soul or self, and their ruach, which is normally translated spirit. Those are not the material parts of us, no matter how you understand those in theological anthropology, they are not the material parts of us, and yet that's what's being formed. We can look at Zechariah 12.1, where he formed the human spirit within us. And so we need not think that this verb we translate formed by itself suggests that we've got a material aspect involved. It doesn't talk about the body, basar, being formed. And Zechariah 12.1 does talk about the spirit being formed. That suddenly becomes very less a material issue and is more an identity issue. Well, then what would dust as an ingredient stand for? If it's not trying to give us a material sense and it's not something that is connected to chemistry or craftsmanship, what, what in the world is the significance of dust in the passage? And again, I just want to point, point out to you that do you see how now we're asking a different set of questions? When you get to the point where you begin probing into the ways that we very casually think about the text and start to see some difficulties, then suddenly we find other options on the table that we can explore and we start asking questions we've never asked before. And they are productive questions. And we find out what dust's significance is even in the next chapter. Because there it tells us, dust you are, and to dust you will return. And so we see to make the connection between dust and mortality. And that connection is one that is maintained throughout Scripture. And so dust has an archetypal significance because it describes something about human identity. Now some people at this point become really resistant because they spot something that's problematic here. They say if dust equals mortality and people are created out of dust, formed out of dust, then that sounds like, I know this is impossible, but it sounds like you're suggesting that there could have been death before the fall. And now we've got the theological issues raising their heads. Okay, how do we address something like that? After all, people would say, Paul teaches very clearly that there's no death before the fall. Romans 5. It's in the New Testament, Doc. <laughs> I'm an Old Testament guy, so you know they have. There is this New Testament back there. It's back by the maps. I know those pages are still stuck together in your Bible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but Romans 5 death comes through sin. I mean, how much more clear could it get? But wait a minute. And you're saying, oh no, oh no. Okay, wait a minute. Does Paul say that we are created immortal? No, we, we, we infer that from what he says, but he doesn't say that. He says death came through sin. Now how well do you think Paul knew his Bible? His Old Testament? Yeah, probably pretty well. And so wouldn't you suspect that he knows um, Genesis 2 pretty well? Of course, of course, I'm leading you on. You're not going to like this, okay? <laughs> Isn't he aware of that? Yes. So he's well aware that in the garden there are two trees. The tree of wisdom and the tree of life. And Paul could deduce, just as any of us could, that immortal people 
would not need a tree of life. Why in the world would you put a tree of life in the garden if the people are immortal? What, what Paul is pointing to takes full account of the role of the tree of life. The tree of life was, uh, was offered as a remedy, as an antidote for people who were already subject to death. That was made available to them in the garden. And when they took from the tree, the forbidden tree, the tree of wisdom, God had told them, when you do that, you will be doomed to die. And that's what happened. They ate from that tree of wisdom, and God drove them out of the garden, and he set up the fearsome keruvim. Those are not the pudgy little babies on Valentine cards. These are the mighty, fearsome guardian creatures, the cherubim. Sets one at the garden to prevent their access to the garden and from the way to the tree of life. And therefore, when they sinned and were cast from the garden, they no longer had access to the tree of life. Having lost the antidote with no remedy available, Paul readily says that because why are we why are we subject to death? Because of sin. That's why. We're subject to death because of sin. And that's because when we sinned, we became subject to death because we lost the antidote. And that antidote will only be provided again through Christ, who is life and who gives us life. After all, the life and wisdom that were available in the garden, though God may well have made those, have vested those trees with those kinds of things, let's not be deceived. Life and wisdom come from God. And if the trees are the mechanism for that, whatever, that's fine. But life and wisdom come from God. And they forfeited that life that came from God. And it's only Christ who will provide it again. And so we are subject to death because of sin. I'm happy to say that Paul and I are in perfect agreement here. <laughs> now, is this something that is archetypal? Well, let's look at scripture. Psalm 103, 14. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Okay, ringing bells. Okay, we've got the same language here, formed and dust. But please, please notice that very small but very important pronoun, we. We are formed from dust. Every human being is formed from dust. Paul himself, the first man was of dust, and all are from dust. So I figure when I've got Psalms and Paul working with me here, I, I feel in good company, and we're doing all right. But follow the implications. If we are formed from dust, then being formed from dust does not describe material formation. You are each formed from dust. Does that describe your material biological origins? No, it does not, because being formed from dust does not preclude being born of a woman, which I suspect most of you are. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Canada is a special place, especially Eastern Canada. <laughs> but you see, it, if we're all formed from dust, and yet we are born of woman, then follow the equation, being formed from dust does not preclude being born of woman. That means to say that Adam, humanity, was formed from dust, 
is not suggesting that that's biological or material kind of statement. Because we've seen that dust is an archetypal category. And the ingredient says something about our identity. Maybe it's not as good as angel wings and clouds, but it's, it's an ingredient that says something important about our identity. We jump on that and we think it's talking biology and genetics and all of these things. Cultural river malfunction here. Because we're trying to think in our world, in our terms, in our categories with our questions. So being formed from dust is not a statement of material origin. It's a statement about human identity. It's who we all are. We're mortal. We're frail. And the Bible says those things over and over again. Old Testament and New Testament, prophets and poets. This is what we are. And that's what's expressed in Genesis chapter 2. So being formed from dust is intended to communicate what all humans are, not what Adam uniquely is. This is not Adam was formed from dust, the rest of us are born from woman. And that's why I call it archetypal, not individual. Because it's not giving us something that is uniquely true of Adam. It's rather something that's characteristic, characteristic of all of us. Just letting it sink in. I'm seeing a few <laughs> Want to talk about woman now? <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Let's think through the issues. Does Adam believe that Eve was built from one of his ribs? And you're all saying he's asking that question and that means it's not the answer that I think it is. And what's he going to do now? <laughs> good, good. You're thinking with me. You're moving with me here. Okay. No, Adam does not think that. How do I know? I know because Adam tells us so. What are the very first words out of his mouth? She is bone of my bone, and he didn't stop there. And flesh of my flesh. There's more than a rib going on here, folks. Okay? I ordered a rack of ribs in the restaurant yesterday. It would be real disappointing if they just brought me bones. I want bone of its bone and flesh of its flesh. <laughs> so, so we have to understand that there's a whole lot more going on here. So how do we sort this out? Well. Let's start here. We've learned the importance of words and understanding them. So here we go. Let's take that word that's translated rib. The Hebrew word is tzela. Yeah, you have to put a little t on it. Tzela, okay? And we should look at all the places where it's used pertaining to anatomy so we can clear this up. Okay, so let's take a look at each one of them. We're done. <laughs> one time only used one time here to refer to anatomy. Huh. Okay, so then how do we figure out what it means at all? See, new questions. You're asking them, I'm assuming you're asking them. Stick with me here. So what do we find out? Well, this term is not used anatomically, but it is used maybe 20 times or so architecturally. And architecturally, it refers to one side of a pair. So the north side of the altar, the south side of the, of the altar, the east side of the temple, the west side of the temple. 
sides, and generally when there are only two. So when the text of Genesis 2 says um, that God took from Adam one of his, we shouldn't say one of his ribs, we should say one of his sides. Oh, that's somewhat more serious. <whistles> Cracked in half. And from one half, presumably the better one, he has built Eve. <laughs> and in my 40 years of marriage, I will testify that it's the better one. Anyway, no duress. So, so God takes one of Adam's sides and builds Eve. Wow, that's a whole lot different than we've heard, but if you look through the Aramaic, the Septuagint, the Vulgate, all these translations, early translations of the Hebrew text, they're all ambiguous about this. They use a word that can, you know, like we might say, a, a side of beef. Okay? Um, it, you know, kind of more than just a, a rib going on. Okay? Third and fourth century, Rabbi Samuel ben Nachmani was already saying, we're not talking about rib here, we're talking about side. Okay, so this isn't something that I just made up as something, I mean, this, this has roots all the way back. Well, so if God took kind of half of him, that would be very serious surgery. Not that removing a rib wouldn't be, but that's pretty serious surgery. But, but wait a minute. Why are you thinking surgery? Okay, cultural river. We automatically think kind of in, in our world of situation. Israelites wouldn't be thinking of surgery. And certainly when they read about Adam in a deep sleep, they wouldn't be thinking anesthesia. They don't know anything about that. So, how would an Israelite read this text? Remember, author's intention, let's get into their world here. So what does the deep sleep have to do with it? Well, the Hebrew word tardema, deep sleep, occurs about 15 times in both noun and verb forms, and we can build the profile pretty easily. Now, there's really two different ways it goes. Sometimes a deep sleep occurs in a situation, in a context, where there's danger and the person doesn't know it. So Jonah, he's asleep in the bottom of the boat, doesn't know that the boat is thinking about breaking up, even though breaking up is hard to do. And, and the, the, <laughs> so, so there's, there's this looming, looming danger. Um, Saul, when David creeps into his camp, you know, I've told my students, I've got, I've got, it's a toggle. I can either be corny or boring, and I usually pre figure you prefer corny. So anyway, um, so Saul in his camp, um, the whole camp is, is in Tardima, they're fast asleep. When David and his men are creeping in and eventually get right to Saul and have the spear in hand, danger is looming. In the story of Sisera and Barak, and uh, Sisera and Deborah and Barak, Okay, Sisera, the Canaanite general, flees the battlefield in, in defeat, tries to go to the tent of someone he believes is an ally, Hever and his wife, Jael. And she welcomes him into the tent. She offers him a glass of warm milk. She settles him down and tucks him in under a nice warm blanket. And after the, the, the exhaustion of the battle, he falls into a tardema not realizing that she's got a tent peg and a hammer over his head and let's just say it's another temple story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so sometimes this word is used when danger is looming. Now, that really doesn't fit the context here very well. 
you know, <laughs> woman on the floor, you know, <laughs> that somehow danger is looming because woman has been formed. That's certainly not the impression we get. Okay, so we have to go to what the other meaning is. And we find that that pertains to a visionary state. Okay, unresponsive to human realm and correspondingly responsive to communication from the divine realm. The best example is Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, where he is in a deep sleep. He's already cut the animals in half. This is the ratification of the covenant. And in a deep sleep, he sees the torch and the oven pass between the parts. And we get the ratification of the covenant while he is in this visionary state. Fairly significant event taking place in a vision, which ratifies the covenant between God and Abraham and eventually Israel. There are other examples as well, Eliphaz, Daniel. So, Tardema, context here, not looming danger. Context, visionary experience. That means Adam sees this in a vision. God has put him into a deep sleep and then shows him himself being cut in half, Adam being cut in half, and Eve being formed from it. And what message does that give Adam? It gives him a message of identity. Man and woman, halves of a whole. A lesson we're still trying to learn. Humanity has a gendered identity. This isn't like the beasts that Adam was naming. This is something ontologically different. She is of the same essence, the same self. Now again, this is talking about humanity. This is archetypal. It doesn't mean you have to go around the world looking for the, you know, the person who matches up with you to make a, okay? This is not individual. It doesn't say anything about people who don't get married or can't get married or whatever. It's not about that. It's about identity of humanity. Now again, Septuagint had for this uh, sleep, ecstasis. You recognize the word ecstasy there. Probably a little bit different in range, but Vulgate, as early as Tertullian, affirmed by Ainsworth in 1616, Princetonian McCloskey, 1904. This is, you can find this in the history of interpretation. This is not something that's kind of brand spanking new here. And so now we turn to Genesis 2.24. What does this mean? See, didn't... That is why. Wait a second, what is why? Other translations say, this is the reason, this is the cause. What? What is the cause? Well, the fact that man and woman have this shared identity, this shared essence, that is the reason. The narrator tells us, this is the narrator, and it's an Israelite narrator in an Israelite context. Israelites already know about marriage, so he's not trying to tell them that people should get married. Okay, but he says, this is why it happens that a man would leave his father and mother, his closest community relationship, and be united to his wife so that they become one flesh again. That last line is not about sex. It's about the fact that they are in identity, one flesh. And the idea that they get married is a manifestation, a demonstration of that inherent ontological trait. So Genesis 2.4 doesn't establish marriage as an institution. That already exists in Israel. This is an Israelite author talking to an Israelite audience. It's not about sex. It addresses ontology. That is who we are really, and therefore human identity. Together man and woman represent the ontological identity of humans. This is who we are. So, they're of the same essence, in equal measure. 
and it supersedes our identity in clan previous family relationships. That's what the text says. It's talking about why marriage happens. It's not trying to tell you that it should happen. Or there's this thing, let's call it um, marriage, and how should it work? Israelites already know how it works. What the narrator is saying is why it works. People marry because that stitches back together our identity as gendered humanity. Now, so what makes Adam and Eve so special? Why the attention? I would say it's because of priestly roles. In Genesis 2.15, it says that God puts Adam in the garden to serve and keep it. And we often think of those as landscaping, gardening, you know, whatever. That would be pretty trivial. But we found out that the Garden of Eden is not just green space, it's sacred space. It's where God dwells. No surprise then that we find these same two verbs describing priestly activity in sacred space, in the temple, in the tabernacle, throughout the Pentateuch. These are verbs that describe maintaining sacred space, keeping it sacred. And so God creates Adam outside the garden, by the way, you should note, and then puts him inside the garden with this task of serving and keeping the garden. Again, not maintaining it as green space, but maintaining it as sacred space. And the, th the threat to sacred space is not just sin. Because people said, why would you have to pre you know, maintain sacred space if there's not sin yet? Well, sacred space is, is a center of order. And people have been created in order to be partners with God in bringing order. And so they're supposed to be doing that, expanding sacred space and preserving its sacred nature. Eve is a helpmeet to help Adam in that sacred task. As priests, they are representatives of all humans. But at this point, this is no longer archetypal. This is not all humanity in sacred space. Now it's Adam and Eve as priestly representatives in sacred space. Here we're picking up them as individuals because this does not pertain to all of us. The priestly representation then differs from archetypal. And we can think of Israel as priests, remember? Israel was a kingdom of priests. And as priests, they mediated knowledge of God and they mediated access to sacred space. So I would suggest that Adam and Eve have this priestly function. I'm moving a little quicker here because I dawdled. And so now we have a little bit more to cover still. So archetypes. If the details of the forming apply to archetypes, as I've suggested and offered evidence, we have no information about the forming of individuals. The forming accounts are not dealing with individuals, they are dealing with archetypes. Archetypal identity does not negate the existence of the individual. I believe Adam and Eve are real people in a real past, flesh and blood people. But remember, Abraham is a flesh and blood person too, yet the Bible can also treat him as an archetype. Archetypal significance does not negate or work against their, their individuality. So the appropriate question as we read this passage is, is that what people really are? If it's about human identity, then that's the truth of it. Is this what we really are? We have the archetypal nature in Genesis 3, 16 through 19. The uh, working the ground and uh, the anxiety and childbearing, all of those things which pertain to everybody. So we can see this archetypal. And I would further note that the ancient Near East, every time it talks about humanity in a place we might call human origins, it refers to archetypes and archetypal ingredients, always. So again, I didn't have to get this idea from the ancient Near East. Once I get it from the biblical text, I say, not surprised that it's also in the rest of the ancient Near East. So what's the message of identity in the Genesis archetypes. Well, it talks to us about human identity. We're created with mortal bodies. 
relationship identity, given the role of serving in sacred space, which implies a relationship with God. Ontological identity, we're different from the animals. Gender identity, we're divided into male and female, and so would seek out a new family relationship. These are identity issues. They are extremely important identity issues. They are, they are filled with theology. And we miss it because we're too busy trying to argue against evolution and to make it a science book, which it is not. So how should we think? Well, again, I'll go back to the importance of recognizing what the biblical claims are. We should be willing to accept those who come to different conclusions as faithful interpreters. Faithful interpretation can sometimes lead to different conclusions. Acceptance of science does not require rejection of the Bible or faith, because the Bible is not making those sorts of claims. So how do we sum this all up? So some of our conclusions here. Agency is more important than mechanism. The Bible's claims have to do with God as agent, regardless of what role he played. God is the creator. That identifies his agency. We believe that. The Bible claims that. Agency. But the Bible does not discuss mechanism. Science explores mechanisms. And if science decides that God is not the agent, now we've got a beef. But science can't decide that. Scientists doing metaphysics can decide that, but science can't decide that. So that's not a beef with science, it's a beef with certain scientists. And there are loads and loads of scientists who are faithful believers, committed to Christ. Just go on the biologos.org website and read the testimonies. Okay, so agency is the important issue here. For biblical theology, agency is what is important. When we start getting to dust as somehow reflecting a scientific process, we're dabbling in mechanism, and I would say the Bible does not do so. Second point. God has made us to be more than what he made us from. That is so important. Whether you think that God made us from uh, primordial soup of amino acids, or from a line of primates, or less dignified, right from dirt. Some people claim, oh, I am not from any primate. No, I guess you're from dirt. And that's, you know. But whatever he made us from, the whole point is he made us more than he made us from. And notice, of course, God is the subject of there. God made us more than God made us from. God's the maker. That's the agency. Mechanism's unimportant. All humanity today traces its identity to Adam and Eve. Our identity. Whether or not we trace biology or genetics, that's a more difficult question to address, certainly from the biblical standpoint. But when you think about this idea that God has made us more, think of God's track record. Okay, Israel, Deuteronomy 23.5, your father is a wandering Aramean. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 3, your father is an Amorite, your mother is a Hittite. Israel came from very undignified ethnic stock. And it doesn't matter what they came from. Because God, through his election, has made them more than what he made them from. And that's what's important. What God has made them to be. Not what they came from. Think of the same thing with ourselves. What have we come from? Well, our identity is everyone is, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. 
And Paul tells his audience, some of you were drunkards and carousers, adulterers and murderers and thieves, but you are no longer because Christ has taken you out of that and you are new creation. God has made you more than what he made you from. And the old has passed away. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live as what, has, what God has made me to be. Ephesians 2, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What's important biblically? It's not the biology and the genetics. God has made us more than what he made us from. That's what counts. And the Bible's not interested in mechanisms. It's interested in agency. So some people today think there's a war out there. A war between science and faith. We don't need to think that way. There's no reason to think that way. We always battle against unbelief. We always battle against skepticism. But that's not inherently what science is. And if you want it, the war can be over. If we just think about Cultural River and let the Bible be what it is and speak the powerful message that it has, which too often we have missed entirely because we've been too busy trying to fight our own battles in our own cultural river. So, is there a right or wrong here? Marco Antonio Dominus, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. The positions we hold combine presuppositions, probabilities, preferences. And that's how we come to interpretations and we can come to different ones. Faithful interpretation can still lead to different conclusions. The Bible's role is not to solve all our problems. The Bible's role is to help us understand the plans and purposes of God so that we might partner with him, participants in the kingdom, doing what he created us to do. Work alongside him as his images. That's what it's about. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walton. Uh, of course, we are going to have time for questions, and I can't imagine we'll have too many of those tonight. Um, but if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand, and my colleague, Danny Zacharias, will bring the mic to you. Hi. Um, if Adam and Eve are I kill, um, Okay, then how does that relate to the genealogy of Christ? Mm -hmm. um, Adam and Eve lead to the genealogy of Christ. Of course, the Bible lays it all out exactly as they do. Uh, that doesn't, just because, you know, see, they're the first significant people for Israel as Israel understands the humanity. Um, they have been chosen out for a role. And therefore, of course, Israel traces back to them. Uh, they are real people. Again, I've made that point. They're real flesh and blood people. Um, real, yeah, in real time. Um, so again, it's natural that they would fit into a genealogy. In fact, it's, the genealogy is one of the reasons I still consider them to be real people in a real past. Okay, but because of the role they have, Israel traces back to them. So 
Um, the idea of adding up the numbers in the genealogy, uh, I think I talked about that a little bit last night. Um, we shouldn't assume that genealogies in the ancient world or even the use of numbers in the ancient world is the same as we would use them. So I'm, I'm not quick to think all we have to do is do the math. Here's a question from online. What implications do we have for our theology of God when we say that we did have death before the fall? Um, it causes us to rethink some things, but I don't think it messes up our theology. Uh, we still have to think through exactly how all of that works. Um, but uh, again, lots of people say there couldn't have been death before the fall because God said it was good. Or well, we talked about that last night. Good doesn't mean perfect. Okay, and death is something that is eventually going to be resolved. And of course, God had offered an antidote for it. We, we just lost access to it. Okay, so death was part of that pre-fall world. And that's not eventually how it will be. Revelation 21 tells us, tells us differently. There's a, there's a new world coming. Okay, but it really doesn't mess up the sin and salvation issue or any of those kinds of things. It, it does require some kind of repositioning of the pieces, but it doesn't mess up our theology. Mine, mine will be a slightly longer question. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, uh, by the way, thank you very much. Um, this has been excellent. Uh, a lot of people are more concerned not about Genesis than they are about Romans. Mm -hmm. um, now, my first introduction to exegesis of Romans was in the first year of my Bible college, first full year, so 1976. Don't add things up to guess my age. <laughs> um, and I was given a copy of Charles Hodge's commentary on Romans, which I worked my way through. Um, I have always looked back to his thought about Adam as the federal head, mm -hmm. as opposed to Adam as, well, the various other possibilities. So he's elected to be the one who represents, and whatever he does, then mm -hmm. everybody else, that comes to us. And as I look at Romans chapter 5, um, as Paul is talking in verses 12 and following, he makes some, some claims there. One of them is that um, death comes from sin, um, but sin is not uh, judged uh, until there's law. Right. But sin reigns, or death reigns, until um, Moses. Mm -hmm. So really he's talking not about the Mosaic law, but he's talking about don't eat. Mm -hmm. But then he also says, before law, there was sin. It just wasn't imputed. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about this sinning before law comes mm -hmm. and uh, talk about Charles Hodge's notion of federalism and how that fits in with mm -hmm. other population? Yeah, I, I'm very comfortable with some aspects of federal headship. I'm not totally familiar with all that Hodge does with it, um, but that concept of federal head makes some good sense to me. Um, the uh, idea of Romans 5, I think you've hit on exactly the point. Uh, when Paul says that without the law there is no sin, even though he's not talking about pre-Adam or something like that, yet the point remains. If someone has no accountability, you can't talk about them sinning. Sin is not a word that can work if there's no accountability. And that's the point Paul's making for a different time period, but it still maintains if there, if, 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 I can only say if, if there are other people alongside Adam and Eve and there's no accountability, they can't sin. Okay, because they haven't been held accountable. You know, our, our pets can't sin. They can be dastardly and they can do things we don't like, but we can't call it sin. Well, maybe cats we can. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> so I, I think the point is well taken. Um, that, you know, even Paul's making these kinds of distinctions that become important as we try to sort things out. But now let me say another thing on that matter. Lots of people will kind of push me to say, okay, so um, how do you view the kind of 
the humans that would have been there and how we should assess them and whether they'd be judged or not and all of those things. Well, at this point, you know, there's, there's really nothing to be able to say because science can't address that. And the Bible theoretically could, but it doesn't. And therefore, if neither science nor the Bible tell me, I have no source of knowledge and all I can do is guess and guessing doesn't do any good. And somebody else could guess differently and we're still all just guessing. So I think this certainly um, leaves us in a position where we say, you know, we don't have all the answers and that's okay. What is the role of the Bible? Not to give us all the answers. Okay, there's certain things we're supposed to get and we're supposed to be content with that. <laughs> and uh, instead of just trying to work out all the things that God didn't bother to tell us. So intriguing stuff, yeah. I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask a question from here again. This is a, a summary of one that's come in, as well as one that someone asked me. As far as your description of cultural river, um, how normative can we assume that it is in the light of uh, literary texts often coming from the elite, mm -hmm. and therefore, uh, as we read it and talk about cultural river, how how normative can we assume that anyone in the ancient Near East mm -hmm. reading it? It would be in that type of cultural river. Um, again, we certainly have limitations. Uh, it's granted that most of our texts from the ancient world come from the elites, from the palace, from the temple. They're the ones that cared about writing. <laughs> and the common people, for the most part, didn't. And they didn't operate by that. So it, it may not reflect common thinking. But generally, we find that everything that we're told about how the people were engaged in the, the rituals and in the temple worship, and we've got plenty of texts about that, um, suggest that indeed we are talking about how people thought. Um, remember that on a situation like this, I'm just trying to ask a basic question. Um, what's more important to them in the ancient world, biology or identity? And you know, that's, that's not really a tough thing to, to reach conclusions on as you read these texts. All the texts give us windows to the ancient world but they don't give us every window from every perspective. And so there's things that we would still like to know more about um, that we might not have access to. Nevertheless, a million texts is a lot, and um, those texts can really give us a, uh, far more information that we could figure out on our own. And they give us a sense of how things work. So um, uh, do they give a full-orbed understanding of every aspect of life in the ancient world? No. but. We'll take what we can get, and we'll do with it what we can. Danny? Thank you so much for uh, your teaching. It's been really good. Mm -hmm. I just have a, f a quick question. So what would you... How do you see the event of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 based on your... Um, uh, understanding of the archetype and non-archetype. Good, thank you. Um, we have to try to read it through, of course, their eyes, through their culture. Uh, we recognize that they never refer to it as a fall. In fact, neither does the New Testament. The fall is terminology that comes after the New Testament. Israel, in the Old Testament, never again comes back to this event. Maybe that's n not a way to judge how important it was to them, but it seems to say something. Um, that they didn't go back and uh, insist that it all goes back to Adam, and Adam and Eve are to blame, and we're on this mess because of them, and sin came to all of us. Never. The Old Testament just doesn't treat those things. We think of the fall um, in terms of disobedience, in terms of eating forbidden fruit, and while I'm not going to say that those things didn't happen, that's not the main deal. Those are the symptoms, the manifestations of what the real problem was. People ate from the tree of wisdom. God told them not to eat from it, not because he didn't want them to have wisdom, but because wisdom is gained through particular processes. And just to pluck it and grab it for yourself is not the way. 
God intended for them to be wise, but he intended, we presume, to mentor them to that point. When they took from the tree of wisdom, they were taking wisdom for themselves. Wisdom is associated throughout the Bible with order. And by taking from the tree, they were making a statement. We are in charge. We are the center of order. We are going to order things around us. We are the fount of wisdom. And there's no room for two sources of order or wisdom in God's way of thinking. And so they're driven out. Good luck with that. <laughs> Making order around yourself. As a result, instead of bringing increased order, like they were supposed to be doing as God's images, instead of preserving sacred space as they were supposed to be doing as priests, instead they brought a disorder into existence. And so I don't just talk about a toggle kind of thing that you've got two categories, good and evil. We're, we're often prone to do that. I want to talk about three categories. There's non-order, which is not moral in nature. It's not good or evil. It's just not yet ordered. Non-order. There's order. That's what God was establishing through creation. God works through wisdom, as Proverbs 8 tells us, as he brings about order centered on himself, centered in sacred space. So there's non-order. There's order as a continuing process that people are supposed to help with. But then there's a third category, disorder. Disorder is moral in nature. Disorder is a violation. And so we live not in a world of two, good and evil. We live in a world of three, non-order, order, and disorder. And sin in the Old Testament is connected more to the concept of alienation. Sometimes we think of sin as missing the mark. I think that's not necessarily good use of, of Hebrew terminology. Difficult discussion. Other times we talk about it as a debt to be paid. That's often our Christian thinking. Christ paid our debt, and he did. But others think about it as a burden to be borne. And lots of times you see this in the Old Testament as it is lifted up, lifted off, a burden. So you can think of it as missing the mark, as a debt, as a burden. But as I read the Old Testament, it seems to me that they're more interested in talking about it as alienation. We are alienated from God. We're separated from Him. We are not having access to His presence. And so it's an alienation issue. Okay, and that's still something that needs to be resolved, but it's something that all of creation suffers under because since we have been alienated from God, then the order bringing process is not opening up as per schedule because we've decided to do it our way and all creation suffers in futility and groans under the fact that we are not doing the job that we're supposed to do and too often when we try to bring order for ourselves it's actually at the expense of the world around us as we exploit it for our own profit. That's another sermon. Yeah. Any more questions? I have one here uh, I can ask as well. Can you just clarify when you talked about chapter 2, and so you talked about deep sleep. So first off, how would you better translate that if you had the influence on translators today? Mm -hmm. And... Does that mean then after everything after that word to the end of this one as last as bone of my bone, all of that is the vision? Yeah. Um, yes, that's the vision. Um, I, I don't know that I'd translate it differently. It does mean deep sleep. But again, when we look at the use of the word, we find out that deep sleep functions in a couple of different ways. Now, if you're doing an expansive enough translation, you can put something in, you know, that he was in a deep sleep with visionary, you know, it gets really awkward and, you know, so it does mean a deep sleep. Trance? Trance? Trance! 
Maybe. I, mean, I guess I communicate something like that. Um, it's hard to say because trance carries other connotations in English. Um, so I don't know. Lots of these, lots of these translation problems that I've brought up. Um, it's not that I would translate it differently. The problem is that we don't have good English words to translate the ideas. You know, I was, I was reading in one book, it was a fantasy book, so it's, but it said, all translations are made up. Um, and they meant by that, that as they explained it, um, languages are different for a reason. You can't just move ideas from one to the other without some cost, without some loss. And that's true. Any of you who have studied Greek or Hebrew know that problem. Um, so this idea that you know, it's, we just don't have the English words to be able to say exactly what they were saying. Mm -hmm. So I tell my students all the time, you know, don't get hung up on translating. I want you to learn what the Hebrew word means in your head so you know the Hebrew word instead of whether you can translate it or not. Okay, translation's a problem. So another good question from Twitter came in. What then was not, not good? What was the not good portion of Adam being alone? Mm -hmm. Because potentially he wasn't alone. This person named Twitter is pretty sharp. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so what was not good about Adam being alone? Uh, the fact is he had been given a job. Serve and keep. He's supposed to be working sacred space. That's a big job. And so it's not good for him to be alone uh, because it's a large task. And so that's what I would say is, is the issue there. I remember when I talk about good, I talk about it as it's functioning the way it's supposed to. This is not functioning the way it's supposed to. Okay? And you could even go s further as to say it's really essential for the other part of gender to be part of that. You know, so I think there are all kinds of things we could talk about there. I never know which side the next one's going to come from. Uh. I know you're not a philosopher. I'm not. But I'm going to ask a philosophical question, or at least a question about a philosopher. Um, many people in our churches struggle because um, I think you've said it, uh, I've certainly said it many times. We have far more Platonic philosophy than we do Christian theology. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to say just a little bit about the struggle that people have looking at all this stuff because we look through it, we look at it through Platonic mm -hmm. categories, yeah. and it's our problem, one of our problems. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not Neptune, it's Pluto, and it's Platonic um, <laughs> thought. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not that bad in philosophy. <laughs> I know it's getting late. Stay with me. I'm moving fast. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, for some people, it's Platonic. For other people, it's Aristotelian. For other people, it's 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 something else. It's it's. Uh, you know, all of the different philosophical systems that we've had, and they've influenced us. They've influenced how we come at questions, how we think about the world. They've influenced our sense of identity and what the questions should be and what the answers are. And we, we have picked that up because that has flowed strongly into our cultural river. Platonic thinking is uh, one of the stronger currents in our cultural river. And we don't, you know, people who never read Plato have no idea, still, surprisingly, are Platonic in their thinking. And that shows us the cultural river is not just based on what you've read. It's based on the influences that, that have shaped culture. And certainly Platonic thinking is one of those, as best as I understand it, I'm really at the edges of my, of my thinking here. But, uh, but certainly as I've, I've read and understood, that's, that's a major um, current in our cultural river. And we ought to be at the place where we're, we're willing to recognize that the things in our cultural river cannot drive the conversation. They must not drive the conversation. Because when we do that, when we read the text through our filter in our cultural river, we cannot help but distort it. We're not reading it as it is. 
We're just reading it as we float on our rafts in our cultural river. I don't know how far I can stretch this metaphor, but anyway. And so we have to be aware of that. And remember that we can never, never, ever purge the whole cultural river of our modern days from our thinking. Impossible. And likewise, we can never, ever, ever understand the full extent of the ancient cultural river. But there's one thing we can do. We can recognize the importance of the two cultural rivers, and we can try our hardest to make the transition. We're not going to catch everything, either from ours or from theirs. But if there are just a few things that we say, oh, now wait a second, that's modern thinking. Let me set that aside. Progress. Let's do it as much as we can. We'll never be able to think like an ancient Near Eastern person. Never. But we can at least learn enough about the ancient world that we can start setting aside some of our modern thinking ideas and try to think in those terms. Even if we only get rid of the anachronism, we've made some progress. This is an email question, John. Uh, Regarding the teleological argument of whether people have purpose or not, if I choose to believe in the theory of evolution regarding the origin of humankind, believing that evolution was God's mean of creating us, then is the implanting of purpose, the divine intervention of God somewhere along the way of evolution? God has purpose in all that he does. And God is our creator as the agent of creation, regardless what mechanism he used, created us with purpose. And that's, that's in it from the, from the start. Um, so um, our awareness of purpose and God's purposes isn't the issue. God has purposes. And that's the teleology. So I'm not sure what that, that other part of it had to, had to do with. Of I think he's... Um piggybacking on the idea of when they talk about evolution, it's purposeless. Well, and I, so, but it's that intersection, there is an intersection of science and faith there. The only people who think that evolution is purposeless is those who believe it happened without God. Those who believe that evolution is how we describe what God actually did as creator, see it as absolutely filled with purpose that God would have worked out that whole process that we call evolution with purpose in mind. Now again, that's just how people who are people of faith and are evolutionists, how they would express that. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to talk about God using evolution because evolution is kind of a human, humanly devised understanding and system. And God doesn't use our systems or, or, or our frameworks. Okay, God does what he does. Now, can someone look at God's creation and describe it in evolutionary terms? I believe they can. They can do that. I've got plenty of friends, dear friends, great scholars, committed Christian people, and they believe that. And so I, I very clearly see that that is a possibility. And the purpose is God's purpose. And we try to discover God's purposes for us. And an evolutionary model would not interfere with God working with purpose. He can do that very easily through that procedure. God works through processes all the time. We see that in scripture. We see it in our lives. It's not a problem for God working through process. It's not a problem for God to work over long periods of time. I mean, really? It's been 2,000 years and Christ hasn't returned yet. There are long periods of time here. God didn't have Jesus born from Adam and Eve. Long periods of time. That's how God works. So that wouldn't be somehow contrary to God's nature. Any? Go ahead. Dr. Walton, um, you've mentioned a number of ancient Near Eastern uh, texts, particularly from Mesopotamia. Uh, there's an Old Testament scholar by the name of Herman who did a biblical theology reflecting uh, the influence of Egypt on uh, 
on uh, biblical theology of the Old Testament. Uh, how much credence would you put on that, and is, is there a lot that can be gained from the study of Egypt? Sure, absolutely. Um, texts from both Mesopotamia and Egypt give us windows into that cultural river, to the ancient world. And we find that as different as Babylon and Egypt are from one another in many, many, many different ways, the fact is they still share some common ground in how they think about cosmology. Um, and uh, even though their cosmology texts really are different sorts of literature, we can still see some common ground. So I, you know, I take help from wherever I can get it, whether it's Egypt or Babylon or Assyria or the Hittites or whoever it might be. Well, I think I speak for everyone in saying we have learned a great deal and we are grateful for your time with us this week. You mean week. you're going to let Hittites be the last word? Okay. <laughs> your call. <laughs> no, I was hoping we, re we could return to the Hebrew word for man cave. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but before we give one last uh, gesture of thank you, um, I'll leave the final word to you, not the Hittites. <laughs> wow. How do you improve on Hittites? Um, again, I go back to the statement I made. It's, it, to me, it's... Let me tell you, can I, do I have time to tell just a little bit of story behind it? You do. It actually came about in interaction with my son. Um, this is my oldest son. He's 33. He's a deep thinker. He's the philosopher um, of, the, of the group. And uh, we were interacting on this whole issue of origins. And I'm trying to hammer stuff out. And, and he's kind of a conversation partner in all of this. And um, at one point he said, Dad, he said, for all that I think you've got right, you're, you're missing really a very important point. And I said, what's that? And he's the one that gave me that line. It's that God has made us more than what he made us from. He said, you've got to see that. That that's really what's important. I'm not going to get through this. And then he said to me, Dad, you've got a platform. People are listening. They're paying attention to what you say. And some of them don't like it. But other people are being helped by it. And you've got to tell them. God made us more than what he made us from. If we keep that straight, we're going to have a straight path. So, go in peace. Thank you. I think that that is a much better note to end on. <laughs> um, perhaps I could pray for you before Please. Yes. you go. Lord, we thank you for John and the ministry you have given him. We pray that we would endeavor always to be faithful interpreters, that we would be gracious even in disagreement, especially in disagreement, and we would remember that it is your desire to be with us, Emmanuel, God with us. You care for us. We see that in creation. We see that most fully and perfectly in the incarnation of your Son. May we honor him in all we do and say and think. And we commit John to your care as he brings this message to people all around the world. We thank you for the privilege of having him here this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>